Hello, welcome to Space Oddities. Happy New Year to all of you. We hope you're all well and that you had a fantastic Christmas and New Year. Thank you so much for being here. We are Space Oddities. I'm joined this evening by a, by a more um, a complete panel uh, than we've had recently. So I'm joined today by Michael and Roger and Bernard and Lou and Rachel. And uh, we've got Daz popping in and out as well, uh, like the Scarlet Pimpernel. Um, and um, he's still having connection problems, poor soul. So uh, how are you guys? Everybody okay? Hi, thank you. That's yeah. fine. Yeah. Oh, good. Happy New Year. I presume and we're ready to start the new year with a bang? Yeah. Yay. Happy yes. New Year to everyone. Is that Happy a big year. bang? <laughs> we're delighted to welcome uh, uh, Lou back, who's uh, who's unfortunately been rather ill. Uh, he and his family have been rather ill over Christmas. So welcome back, Lou. We hope you're feeling better. Thanks very much. On the mend. Good, good. And uh, Rachel's looking her, her normal radiant self now after that uh, protracted illness that she had before Christmas. But you're okay, Rachel. I'm good. Yeah, that's fantastic. Okay. Well, what have we got for you tonight? Well, we've got our normal features. We have uh, Rachel's Viewers Gallery. We have Roger's Guide to the Night Sky. Um, we are going to uh, revisit uh, something we did over Christmas, which was a guide to space events that are coming up, space missions during the, the, uh, the coming year with Bernard. We thought we'd uh, go through that again. Um, because uh, those of you who were watching on December the 19th may recall we had terrible sound problems that night for some peculiar reason. And uh, we've actually deleted the video because it was, was unwatchable. So uh, Bernard will be retreading his steps and telling us what uh, exciting space missions we've got coming up this year. Lou's going to be telling us more about the exploration of Titan. And uh, Michael with his space news, and uh, I've got a couple of odds and ends, and um, and that's it. Now, in a change to what we normally do, um, we're going to let Rachel go first with the viewers gallery tonight, uh, because poor Rachel hasn't had her tea. So what I would like to do um, is do a poll in uh, in the chat, viewers. Um, should we let Rachel go for her tea early? And uh, please say yes if you're in favour of that, uh, and no if you're not. And um, yes. And um, yeah, we must we must do that. We must let Rachel go for for her tea. So, Rachel, should we go straight over to you? And, uh, we can do. Uh, can I, can, sorry, just, can I just for for um, for this week? Oh, sorry, go ahead, Bernard. Yeah, can I just add that if Rachel drops, maybe we'll have Daz coming back in. <laughs> yes, maybe. We'll <laughs> Never know. Maybe we're the same person. I'm just getting changed in between. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Uh, Doubtfire moment. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so we've got our first gallery of 2023. Wow. Um, and we've got a really good mix again, as usual. Um, so I'm really excited to show you what we've got. Um, so we're kicking off with Chris, and he sent us a lovely starless rendition uh, of the California Nebula in Perseus. Uh, he says it's around four hours integration time and he's tried to go for a Hubbley palette but he likes this rainbow gradient look so he went with those instead and it really is <laughs> striking it's really lovely. Uh, that's amazing isn't it? Oh, wow. I'm a big fan of rainbows so I love anything that yeah, sort of goes through. It's so, amazing. It looks like waves coming towards you. Yeah wow. it's really really beautiful. <laughs> lovely image Chris. Uh, then we move on to um, some craters on the moon, which Kev's ever so kindly sent me uh, something I now have to pronounce. Thanks, so I'm Kev. going with Langrinus, Petavius, and Vendelinus, um, which he took on the 10th of December. Um, and he said these are stacked in autostack uh, with med wavelet sharpening in Registacks, and then onto Photoshop. If those weren't the correct pronunciations before, they are now. We've just established them. This is really sharp. Lou, will you, uh, will you write to the IAU and tell them? <laughs> I shall. I shall. Let me make a note here. I might even make my own catalogue. <laughs> mm. But um, yeah, this lovely, lovely image. Beautiful. Absolutely. Well done. Indeed. Very good. That's, I love that. That is just... Isn't it? That, that yeah, will be I like an image where you can really like feel the texture by looking at it. Yeah, mm. especially the one on the right with all those those <laughs> mountains and the 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 channel um, leading from the middle of the yeah. crater downwards. That's that's amazing, isn't it? It's really it's lovely. Um, and I think we've got another one from Kevin, uh, which is Mars opposition. Um, 
and he said all these images are to the same scale so they were blessed with good seeing between the 7th and 10th and the bright blob in the first of the images is olympus mons obviously which is a lot uh, yeah oh, wow. um but he said obviously you can tell the reduction in size as mars recedes from earth and it's striking so you can actually wow. see look at different. that that's fantastic. That's amazing. That's amazing. That's good, isn't it? Yeah. Wait, wait where, where are all the canals, though? What's... Yeah. <laughs> where are they? Mm, they've been drained. <laughs> <laughs> they had a hose pipe band, too. I didn't know your middle name was Schiaparelli, you know. <laughs> <laughs> distant, distant relative, yes. <laughs> so thank you, Kev. Really lovely collection. Um, and we've got the Rosette Nebula in Monoceros by Jerry. Wow, um, well done, Jerry. And he's processed these in PixInsight and Photoshop. Oh, cool. I think it's such a pretty nebula, this one as well. It's one of my favorites. There's a lot of drama going on here. It's wonderful. <laughs> um, mm. By the way, as regards that moon image, um, Ian says, get Mary to do an etching of that moon image. <laughs> That's a damn good idea. I'm sure yeah. she'd like to do that. <laughs> I can see that, that Kev saying that I was close, so I've obviously pronounced one wrong. <laughs> <laughs> or two, but we'll find out later. Um, <laughs> then we've got another image by Jerry, which is the Jellyfish Nebula, which I want to say is in Gemini. Um, on, and again, then. with the same kit and the same details. Oh, really lovely that's beautiful mm. isn't it? yeah the way yeah, this one's it? colored it almost reminds me of sort of the same colors you get in the eastern and western veil it's got that yeah mm. that really yeah. harsh red and blue to it so. there, there, really is a, there really is a sort of <clears throat> an illusion not an illusion but uh, the fact that it's darker on the left and brighter on the right as if it was eliminated by a light source which of course it's not but it gives you sort of yeah. 3d vision of, of this yeah. of the structure it's fantastic yeah very true <laughs> well, I, don't, I don't think i can tell the difference between between so many of these and hubble images and i think i think we ought to have a um do a little series and um with uh uh these images that that our uh, viewers are sending in and the series would be entitled is it hubble <laughs> and they have, to, they yeah. have to tell whether Hubble took it or whether an amateur astronomer took it. Mm. Well, there's so much talent from like our viewers that send things in. Yeah, the images are always of a really high standard. But yeah, mm. on any anything from a mobile to you know a proper rig. So yeah, they, they do amazing. They do. They do an amazing job. Well done. Well done, viewers. Uh, uh, well, I have to pause in because, you know, we haven't done an image since August. So I was really excited. We've just got a garden observatory built. Um, which is a Christmas gift from my dad and mum. So we took our first uh, set of mono data again, which is new to us. We've just started a mono data. So we went off with my favourite nebula, which is the Heart Nebula. And it was about four hours. We're adding more to it as I speak outside because it's clear. Um, mm. Oh, look at that. Ooh. Wow. So awesome. hopefully, hopefully we'll be getting some more. Stunning. Um, obviously the moon's in the way, but you know, with that eager, we just want to get out. <laughs> <laughs> so we're doing it anyway. <laughs> and uh, that is it for the gallery this week. Thank Aww. you very much. That's fantastic. Fabulous. Uh, great. As, That's wonderful. Oh, well, as, oh she's dropped out. <laughs> as, I, I, as, as Lou mentioned, uh, these the quality of these images are just remarkable. Absolutely remarkable. It's It's visual poetry. I love it. And I think, you know, um, we've said this before, but I'll say it again, because I'm that sort of a guy, that, uh, you know, just a few years ago, amateurs would not have been able to have taken these these sorts of no. images. Uh, you know, the technology at an affordable price was just not there. So, so yeah, that's lovely. Did you say that your, your mum and dad bought you an observatory for Christmas, Rachel? Because they built, my dad built one for us, so he literally... He got a shed and then converted it all, built it from scratch, made it a roll-off roof, insulated it. Wow. You name it. He uh, he worked and worked. And you know, they did it in a couple of days because they didn't, just didn't stop through the rain and the ice. And we only started it at the end, sort of mid to end of November. So it was freezing. 
Um, oh obviously, well, my dad you... worked full time, so he was working all week and then coming to our house on weekends and evenings and putting a light in the dark and just working, working, bless him. So, you must oh. show us a photograph of it. If, if you I would will. like to see a photograph of, of Rachel's observatory, say so in the comments, viewers. Can I say something about your, what you said about the technology that you're using in these uh, photographs? Um, I think it throws back to our discussions on uh, uh, the uh, benefits of space technology. And I think a, a lot of the photographic um, uh, equipment now that's coming online would be a direct result of instruments on spacecraft, maybe, or, or, or certainly the electronic side of the, of the yeah. instruments. Um, so, no, so another benefit from the space technology, I would have thought. Definitely, definitely. I'll yeah, well, you, PowerPoint, um, and I'll share it, and then you can put it out at some point in tonight's show. I'll put a picture up. Okay, cool. Yeah, definitely. Because yeah. I was going to say, hey, Rachel, know. could you put in a, a good word for the rest of us with your dad? <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. You know, has a little Just paying to be an only child. <laughs> yeah, because I, I got an I got an apple from my mum and dad for Christmas, and we get an observatory. It hardly seems fair. And you're so, not talking about. Not talking about a computer either. <laughs> <laughs> if it was okay. an Apple Mac, that's not too bad. Uh, yeah. <laughs> right. Ian Ian says uh, uh, <laughs> there we are. Okay, Ian, we'll 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 sort that out before the end of the program, I'm sure. So you're in so, competition with Lou as well then? Yeah. <laughs> They, they are the runoff twins. Yeah, mine, hey. mine's, not up, mine's not running yet. So you're, that you're to me, to you, to me, to you. <laughs> <laughs> up your end, down a bit. <laughs> okay, mm. right then. Um, we've been discussing recently, viewers. Uh, you know what we're going to be getting up to on this channel in 2023, and we've had some ideas. We want to grow, obviously, and improve the number of people. Uh, that uh, that actually watches. So you know, anything you can do among your families and friends to encourage people to watch us will be gratefully appreciated. Obviously, and uh, we've got a few plans in that regard. But I think I'll probably talk about this more than the next week. But basically, what we want to do in 2023 is to grow the channel a lot more, get a lot more people watching, and uh, with your help, we can do it. And we've got, some, as I said, we've got some ideas. But we'll talk more about that next week. For this evening, though, what I'd like to do now is to go over to Lou. And uh, you may remember that Lou uh, started a fascinating series a few weeks ago, seems an eternity ago now, uh, about the history of the exploration of Titan, which we all know is a fascinating world in the solar system. So, Lou, um, would you like to talk us through the next phase of the exploration of Titan, please? Yeah, I'm, I'm afraid it's all changed since I last talked to you guys. Now I have to update all my slides. So. Oh, that sounds uh, interesting. There we are. Then there's your presentation, sir. All right, let's see. Where are we? Ah, here we are. All right. Let's see if I can um, fast forward through a few. Okay, I'm going to make this bigger because uh, yeah. with so many of us this week, I think it's a bit small. So we'll just enlarge that a bit for you. There you are. Okay. I'm trying to... Uh, slip through a few slides here. Okay, all right, brief history of Titan exploration. Uh, so, um, oops. there's a delay in my uh, slide uh, turning, so I have to be patient. Okay. okay. So the last time we did this, which was last year now, uh, we talked about the, um, the early history of Titan exploration from uh, ground observations. We talked about its uh, uh, discovery by Christian Huygens, the namesake of the Huygens probe uh, on Cassini, uh, the discovery of the atmosphere, of methane in the atmosphere uh, by uh, Gerard Kuiper in the 1940s. And so uh, we're going to go today to uh, the, uh, the first uh, robotic uh, exploration, robotic spacecraft exploration of Titan. And that, of course, was the Pioneer 11 spacecraft. There were, uh, um, there were actually five pioneers, five identical spacecraft that were uh, developed. Um, the Pioneer 10 went to Jupiter and Pioneer 11 went out to Saturn. These were the first uh, voyages to the outer solar system 
and so everything that almost everything that they returned was was brand new and and exciting. So let's let's uh, let's see what Pioneer Eleven uh, was able to do. And uh, first, uh, here it is coming uh, above the um, the ecliptic, uh, down around Saturn, and then uh, uh, to south of the ecliptic. Uh, to a somewhat close uh, flyby of Titan. It got within about 355,000 uh, kilometers of Titan. So not that close uh, by our standards today. Uh, and it got within about one and a third uh, uh, Saturn radii of Saturn. And by the way, it was able to confirm that the, um, the um, uh, gaps between the rings were uh, relatively relatively, or, or rather the ring plane was relatively clear of debris. And so that uh, provided information for future exploration, such as Voyager and uh, Cassini and so on. So this, um, here we go. So uh, the spacecraft had, uh, I think it was uh, 11 instruments uh, to uh, check the uh, magnetic fields, um, the uh, various uh, particles, um, he had an ultraviolet uh, imager, had an um, uh, imaging photopolarimeter, had an infrared instrument. And you just load these things up, especially if you're going to send them to the outer solar system. You're going to put all that money into launching and getting them out there. Um, you want to make sure that you take advantage of your investment. And on the right side here of this uh, slide, I, I just wanted to list some of these instruments. And with their principal investigators, there are some giants of planetary exploration uh, on this list. I mean, it's just incredible. Uh, Frank McDonald, of course, the great James Van Allen, for which the uh, Van Allen radi uh, uh, radiation belts are named, Andy Ingersoll, who played a, a, a big role in Voyager and uh, Cassini, Mario Acuna from Goddard Space Flight Center, who is like the king of, of planetary um, uh, magnetism, and and so on and so on. This was just a remarkable group of um, scientists that put these instruments together and uh, uh, helped them operate and to make discoveries. So I just wanted to kind of walk a little bit down memory lane for, um, and remind everybody that um, there, are, there are great people who put their heart and soul into these missions, into the discoveries that they made, including Titan. Mm. So let's go, there we go. Okay, so here is one of the first uh, images of Titan that we had from Pioneer. This um, is of course an, an image from its two color camera. It had a, a, a red a channel and a blue channel. So it's a two color camera. You can see the rings of Saturn. You can see the shadow of the rings on the planet. It was a little disappointing to imaging scientists that there wasn't more detail in the atmosphere of Saturn, as you see in uh, Jupiter, for example, mm -hmm. with all the belts and zones of Jupiter. Um, but down on the bottom here, you see a little speck, and that is Titan, as uh, as Pioneer 11 was approaching Saturn. Lou, can I, can I interrupt? Yes, um, sir. In terms of the quality of the image, uh, am I correct to assume that Pioneer was really built more as a uh, to invest, investigate the, the different fields, like fields, um, science probe than an imagery probe, hence why uh, much more uh, input and interest was put into the, the fields instrument instead of the imaging one. Uh, fields as well as infrared and uh, ultraviolet um, mm. uh, instruments. Um, you know, I could only find five images of, uh, uh, I mean, of Titan by itself from uh, Pioneer 11. I'm scouring the, uh, the, um, the, the various papers that had been produced. So I, so I think that's probably correct. But, but the information that we got back from uh, looking at the polarimetry in, uh, in imaging and uh, wide field infrared and ultraviolet um, observations was, was really astounding. And I'm going to talk about that uh, a little bit. But I think you're I, I, I think you're correct. And of course, with future uh, space missions out to Saturn, we see much improved images with a three color camera on Voyager and upgrades, of course, on Cassini. So 
let's move on here a little bit. Okay, here it is. This is the best image of, of Titan I could come up with <laughs> from Pioneer 11. Now, this is an interesting image because the, the way it was taken, this is from the um, IPP, the Imaging Photopolarimeter, in red and blue light. So it's a two, two channels of, 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 of light. And it scanned Titan with a 0 0.03 degree field of view. And as it scanned, it just put all those images like ribbons together to make a final image. And this is what they were able to come up with. So, okay, you know, we've all seen pictures of Titan at this point. We've seen from Cassini, we've seen from Hubble, we've now seen from James Webb, and this doesn't look very impressive. But back in the 1970s, this was impressive. And the information that they got was really incredible. Uh, first of all, with the infrared instrument, they were able to deduce, uh, doing a heat balance experiment, that uh, Titan is essentially in equilibrium. It doesn't give off any more heat than it receives from the sun. So there's no there's no uh, heat source um, uh, of significance below the clouds. Uh, they were able to get a diameter uh, in red and blue light, uh, 2845 kilometers, 2880 kilometers in blue light. And that's pretty close to the 2575 uh, number that we use today. The difference between those two numbers is probably um, high altitude haze that mm. was uh, uh, yeah. uh, providing a signal. Um, it showed that the light that was being filtered through the atmosphere of Titan was pretty strongly polarized. And that meant that it could tell, uh, get a little information on the types of aerosols that are present in the atmosphere. Remember, we're not seeing the surface here, um, as is pretty evident from the fuzzy edges. We are seeing the cloud tops. And um, as a result, they were able to uh, identify methane haze uh, extending to very high altitudes. Um, they did um, uh, some uh, infrared observations of the cloud tops, got a cloud top temperature of about, uh, about 198C or 75 Kelvin, pretty darn cold. Mm -hmm. And um, they could tell from the, again, from the linear polarization of the integrated disk, the full disk, um, they could get a particle size limit of a less than uh, 0 0.09 microns increasing inside with, in with increasing depth. And that makes sense if we um, look at what we know about Titan today, that we have um, material that is condensing out uh, in the lower atmosphere and um, kind of glopping together like, uh, like hail and falling out. Uh, so... Um, this was really, um, these were really a set of remarkable findings and they're not really produced for the public very, uh, very much uh, because these are fairly technical um, issues. But this shed a lot of new light on Titan, including a global surface temperature of about 80 Kelvin, which um, is not too far from our current number, about 95 Kelvin. Titan's atmosphere is, you know, really thick, 50% uh, denser at the surface than Earth's. So it, it spreads the heat very efficiently from pole to pole. So the temperature doesn't vary much as you move across the disk. So that was Pioneer. And Pioneer was a flyby mission. So it went in, it took its images and other data of Saturn and Titan. And then out it went. Uh, mission uh, ended um, on September 30th of 95. And it is now headed towards the constellation of Aquila, the, the, uh, or is it Aquila? Now I need I need Rachel's help now I can't pronounce uh, <laughs> Aquila the um, the eagle. Uh, we lost uh, contact with both pioneers ten and eleven, um, and uh, as they were headed uh, headed out of the um, solar system, and I think the thinking is that it, they still have not pierced uh, the heliopause, but they will, they will someday. So. That's it for um, exploration of Titan. Next week, we will um, look at the Voyager missions and um, see what uh, we can add to our uh, knowledge base. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Just give me one second. Thank you, Liu. That's, uh, the, I think that image is also important because it, it really 
prepared the the groundwork for for the Voyager probes coming in later on. Um, it was important for right. the mission planners to know exactly you know what Titan could look like from an imaging mm -hmm. instrument. Definitely. So, um, Verification of the atmosphere of methane, as well as um, uh, hydrogen that was identified from the UV measurements, extending out quite far from from uh, Titan, uh, which uh, indicated that the meth methane was being photolyzed, was being broken up by uh, ultraviolet radiation. Carbon was heavy enough to stay, hydrogen was light enough to escape, and that then gets all of the gears turning regarding um, the photochemistry of Titan. And we'll talk more about that next week. Definitely. Well, thank you so much, Lou. Um, I see. Uh, thank you very much. Really interesting. I think we're all fascinated by Titan because it is such an amazingly different little world, isn't it? Well, big world, actually, um, when you compare it to other moons in the solar system. And the fact that it, it, it looks more and more like a primitive Earth in, in deep freeze um it's it's what the more we find out about titan the more alluring it becomes as a place to explore uh so so there you are and uh we've got a few uh few uh, nice comments um steve nice to have you with us steve let's get you back in vision um very soon so that you can join us again because we do miss you uh steve said he loved it so that was nice <coughs> uh, kevin said brilliant lou so um so, uh, so there we are. So, uh, thank you very much for that. So, there we are. I've just got a couple of things I would like to go through. Um, just one news item and a couple of other things that uh, I'd like to talk to you about. So, let me just uh, do this. Uh, this concerns the Trappist system. Now, for those of you that don't know, the Trappist system is a, is a system of exoplanets about 40 light years from the Earth. And there are seven planets that have been discovered orbiting this, this star. And uh, all of the planets have a sort of similar structure and size to the Earth. So obviously astronomers are very interested in finding out what's going on on these planets and what sort of environments that the, they, they host. Now, the, you may be aware that the James Webb Space Telescope has been observing the TRAPPIST system. And we've had the first results from... Uh, the James Webb as regards these um, intriguing exoplanets in this amazing system. As you can see here, the seven planets all orbit uh, within the equivalent of the orbit of Mercury in our own solar system. So they orbit really close to their star. And if you look at these two images, the top image, you see where the dotted line is underneath it, it fits into the, the orbit of Mercury. Um, so they're all very close to their star. However, the hope was that at least one of these little worlds um, or these planets would perhaps have an environment for life. The first results from the James Webb unfortunately indicates that none of these planets have got a thick atmosphere, uh, thick as in something like the Earth. That is not to say that they don't have atmospheres, but the preliminary results indicate that if there are atmospheres, they're more likely to be about the thickness of the atmosphere of Mars or something like that. In other words, maybe just a few percent of, of the Earth's uh, atmosphere's thickness. So this is a bit of a blow, really, because obviously if none of them have got thick atmospheres, they're not going to be very much like, like the Earth. Um, so um, this is uh, very disappointing. This is, however, only a, pre a very preliminary result from the data. We're going to have to wait till later in 2023 to see all of the data because it is proprietary data that has been reserved by the uh, scientists who worked on the observations for one year since the observations uh, as per how these things work. So we're going to have to wait till later in the year to find out the full story. But apparently the preliminary observations of the, all of the Trappist planets don't see any of them with, a, with what we would class a, a thick atmosphere like the Earth or perhaps even Venus. Uh, so um, so uh, there we are. And uh, Ian has uh, got a question, um, I believe. Uh, do you want to answer that, Bernard? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Ian. So first of all, <clears throat> I wasn't aware that the first results of the uh, JWST but the trapeze system came in, and that's so disappointing. Uh, there, there's a whole yeah. observation program with regards to various eclipses that are supposed to be done. 
um, and transit spectroscopy that are just supposed to be done in these atmospheres. So we didn't really know if there was any atmospheres in these exoplanets. So that's that's a bit of a bummer. Um, in terms of the trapeze name, so I'll just answer because uh, I'm from Belgium and it's basically um, it's the it's a it's a project. Uh, th these exoplanets were discovered uh, through a project by the University of Liège um, in in Belgium. And, uh, and they named it TRAPEZ, and they, they really tried to shoehorn this acronym. I can't remember what the acronym is, uh, but the TRAPEZ is the name of, 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 uh, of, um, of beers in Belgium. Uh, you have the TRAPEZ monks, the monks that are do uh, beers uh, uh, throughout, throughout Belgium. There are seven TRAPEZ beers, and for fun, they wanted to try and name the instrument and the mission to discover these exoplanets. Uh, with with this with the, this acronym trapeze and you know they never thought that you know it would become headline news and all that so yeah it's the name of a type of beers in belgium and i think it's a fantastic name so there we go uh bernard i'm just putting what the acronym is in the in the uh the chat window. Oh, yeah yeah good point uh because I, I i always forget it uh, transitioning yeah. planets and planetesimals small telescope there, there you go. are trapeze <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's another great shoehorning of an acronym. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there we are. Yes, we, uh, thank, thanks for that, Rachel, as well. I got it as well. Okay. So bad news initially about the, uh, the uh, Earth-like uh, properties of these, these Trappist planets, which is a bit unfortunate. But we'll see. Wait till all the data comes in. They may be wrong. It's only a preliminary observation after all. So I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't be too forlorn, too forlorn too soon. Um, as yeah. we compare it to the thin atmosphere of Mars, guess where we're putting most of our space dollars to go looking for life? We're Very looking true. at Mars, as yeah. well as um, bodies that have um, essentially no atmosphere like uh, Europa. So uh, yes, that's uh, right. out, I say. Yeah. Um, yeah. And could there be a correlation between the fact that they're orbiting an M dwarf and none of them have any atmospheres? Um, Who knows? Basically, I don't know. I don't know. So it, it could possibly be, but um, we'll have to wait and see. Have to wait and look, look at the full data when we when we are able to see it. I just wanted to mention a few uh, the eclipses that are coming up this year. We start. Uh, let me just make this a bit bigger. We start with a total solar eclipse on the 20th of April, 2023. Uh, as you can see from the map, it's only visible um, really in Indonesia. Uh, the totality is in Indonesia, uh, partially in Australia and uh, other parts north of there, and uh, partially in New Zealand. So unfortunately, the, uh, the total solar eclipse is not going to be uh, visible from, from here, from Europe. So that's a bit disappointing. Then on the um, 5th of the 6th of May, we have a penumbral lunar eclipse, which will be visible from Europe. It's visible from where I live in Spain. In the UK, if you just go down to the bottom um, uh, southeastern tip of the UK, down to Kent or somewhere like that, you may catch uh, a bit of partiality of the eclipse. But for all intents and purposes, it's not really visible in Britain, but it is visible uh, in the area you can see here. Again, Asia does rather well out of it. Um, and then um, lastly, the third and final eclipse of this year is a, an annular solar eclipse on the 14th of October, uh, visible across the, the Americas. So you've got a nice uh, annular solar eclipse. Yeah, for those of you who might not know what an annular solar eclipse is, it's where the, the moon is at the correct distance to form um, a ring as it's against the sun. It's not quite big enough in the sky to cover all of the sun, but just most of the sun forming a ring of light around the moon. And that's an annular uh, eclipse. So really only three eclipses this year, only one visible from, uh, from uh, anywhere near the UK. As I said, if you go down to, the, the, uh, to Kent or somewhere like that, you may catch the the uh, partial lunar eclipse, but otherwise nothing visible from the UK uh, this year, unfortunately. So, so there you have it. That's all I wanted to say. And now, um, thank you, Rachel, for reminding uh, our viewers. Yes, viewers, thank you so much for, for, for the images you do keep sending into us for our gallery. We are much appreciative of that. Do mail them in to spaceoddityslive at gmail.com. One image per email, please. You can send as many emails as you like, but only one image per email, which will make it a lot easier for Rachel to manage this whole thing. Uh, so, um, so there you are. 
And now we're going to move on to uh, Bernard, who, as I mentioned earlier, is going to tell us again uh, about the uh, the upcoming and exciting space missions we've got to look forward to in 2023. So uh, take it away, Bernard. Thank, thank you, Andy. Uh, before, before I go, I'd, I'd like to uh, mention that someone on the on YouTube uh, comments was asking about Kareem. Um, I just wanted to uh, let that person know that Kareem, unfortunately, cannot join at the moment. He's been uh, quite poorly, uh, but he is uh, looking forward to come back as soon as possible. Um, so that's for Kareem. And uh, Rachel has said that she has... Uh, um, that she has a picture of the observatory as oh, well. Oh, we have a look at that before we start? Yes, because I know Rachel wants to get off for her tea. Yes. So uh, let, let's... Uh, <laughs> let's it's all about me. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are so good at looking after me. Okay, let me just uh, let me just put that photo up. Here's, for, here's <laughs> Rachel's Christmas present, everybody. I've literally just put it like... I only I didn't take many because this was happening all while I was poorly, so I just sort of kept going out and taking. So you can see the wood sort of at the side we knew we wanted it to look more like a garden feature because we have to look at it all the time yeah um, so thinking. i was very eager that it looked not too much of an eyesore so uh we started with the frame i think there's johnny using his scientific it needs to be about yay big um, <laughs> <laughs> so they were starting with the with the base building it up that's as far as i would have gotten I would have, that's <laughs> uh, as you can see my uncle had also got roped in <laughs> uh, to joining so they were starting to uh obviously dig the the hole to put the concrete in um for the pier which was all going in there there was my dad setting it and making sure and before i get aggro about the fake grass it was there when i moved in <laughs> um and uh yeah so setting the concrete so obviously the weather was really cold and damp well, so we had to wait a while for that well it is astroturf rachel <laughs> <laughs> It's probably the astroturf. Um, then obviously starting to put everything in place, making sure everything was where we wanted it. Um, then it was built, the shed was on, it was up the roof, so my dad's on there uh, felting the roof and sorting it all out. And then Johnny steps in and does the painting. <laughs> uh, and there we go. So the roof is obviously rolled off there. You can see it rolls off and underneath we're going to have a hanging sort of swing. So it sort of looks like a garden area that will swing under the pergola sort of area. Nice. Uh, and then inside we've got obviously the gear on the left and then we've fitted red lights um, and insulated and things further. Um, it's still not finished, but it's at least functional at the minute. So that is sort of where oh, we're at really at the minute. Nice. Um, but yeah, you like I said we've took an image and he's out there imaging with it now. So it's just tweaking and making it, you know, adding a desk in there and things we want now, really. So very lucky. I was very spoiled. Fantastic. Thanks so much for that, Rachel. Well, there we are. You couldn't imagine a better Christmas present, could you? No, very, I'm very lucky. Yeah, you are. Johnny in his gym jam, says uh, <laughs> says Andrew. <laughs> yeah, the gym jam slash work attire, I think. <laughs> I think he lived in them for most of the time. And I kept saying, you're always in your pajamas, but <laughs> And so what is Christmas? You're allowed to do things like that at Christmas. <laughs> yeah. I suppose so. Don't yeah. tell him that. Yeah. yeah, I haven't been out of my black laundry all, all over Christmas. So there you are. <laughs> okay. Right, thank you for that. Lovely seeing that, Rachel. All the best with it, and I hope you'll have many, many years of happy use out of it. Thank and, you. Uh, I'll, I'll stay online. I'll pop off and go and cook, but I'll keep coming back. <laughs> okay. All right, thanks. Okay, Bernard, anyway, let's get back to uh, what to expect in, in uh, space missions in 2023, because it looks like being a, a fabulous year. Yeah, totally, totally. I, I'm, I'm just still jealous from those pictures. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I hope her dad can come to my place. Uh, and, and <laughs> Anyways, uh, yes. Yeah, so what to expect in 2013? So, so basically, uh, I did this talk uh, two weeks ago, but the, unfortunately, the sound uh, was bad on YouTube for that, for whatever reason. Uh, so we wanted to do this talk again, and and basically, uh, I've just cherry picked some. You know, there's so many missions going out uh, this year. Um, SpaceX, if I recall well, has 16 launches just in January, just to show you the scale of... Well, well of, tomorrow, just yeah. tomorrow, tomorrow yeah. they're launching 115 satellites in one mission. So, 
So yeah, it's man. a lot. Yeah. <laughs> the scale of what's happening in, in, in you know within the space industry is just completely overwhelming. But I, I've cherry picked a few missions that I, I thought were were definitely worth mentioning. So uh, I wanted to take you uh, through through these missions. And you know um, the, the first and foremost, the most important for I think mission in 2023, and I've, uh, I've I've listed on in uh, in the comments early on is Juice. Mm. Basically, this Jeez. is. You know, this is uh, the equivalent of Galileo and or Cassini. It's European's flagship mission that's going to be launched, um, hopefully in April, with Ariane Five um, to uh, to Jupiter, but most importantly to Jupiter's moons, uh, icy moons. And and Juice uh, is an acronym, another shoehorned acronym uh, that is stands for Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer. And the idea is for Juice to be launched. Uh, between the launch window of 14th to 16th of April, it's going to take eight years uh, through various gravity launches. Um, uh, sorry, gravity assists. It's going to take eight years to reach Jupiter, so it's it's uh, it should arrive within the the Jovian system by in July 2031. And there is going to do various orbits um, around Jupiter and and doing various flybys of Ganymede and Callisto, and uh, and with one flyby of Europa. And, uh, and and the, and the, the the jewel of the mission uh, will be uh, that Juice will be orbiting Ganymede, will be the first uh, spacecraft that will be orbiting another moon from in our solar system. Uh, and after a year after a year of orbiting Ganymede, it will um, it will sort of uh, softly land on it. It's going to be an amazing mission, and uh, yeah, I'm just so looking forward to it. And we will definitely do a live launch uh, for for this Ariane Five. We will. You can bet on that. Totally. We'll be there to cover it for you, viewers. Yeah, it's just you know, it's going to be the most mind blowing mission. It's just unfortunate it's going to take eight years to reach there, but you know, planetary uh, science is a uh, astronomy is just a game of patience, and, and we all. Know. Mm. Um, second mission worth mentioning is um, is Psyche, and unfortunately, Psyche's been uh, it's, it's been delayed. Uh, it was supposed to launch last year, or there's been. A, I'm not going to go into detail on, on why it's been delayed and whatnot. But uh, the idea is that hopefully they'll be launching in October or at least Q end of this year. Uh, however, this can shift uh, due to the the problems that have plagued the mission. Um, and it's expected to be launched on the Falcon Heavy. So once that's being launched. And it goes ahead. This can be fantastic. As a reminder, Psyche is going to uh, go and observe a, a metallic asteroid in the asteroid belt. So, fingers crossed on this one, folks. Yeah. The um, if you, if you don't know about Psyche, uh, viewers, um, this is a, a metal rich. Um, well, it's described as an asteroid, but uh, astronomers have a suspicion that it's actually the core of um, of a of a planetoid from the very, very early days of the solar system that uh, got blown apart in a collision, leaving just the core behind. And the precious metals in this asteroid are thought in value to be worth more than the Earth's entire economy. Uh, so it's incredibly precious and, um, and, and well worth the study. So um, that should be a really interesting mission to follow. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, really looking forward to that. And then uh, another mission worth mentioning, it's uh, the European Space Agency's uh, M-Class mission, which is Euclid. Uh, Euclid is supposed to launch, um, I think it was in Q4. Uh, the problem with Euclid is, sorry, Q3. The problem with Euclid, it was supposed to launch with the Soyuz. However, geopolitical events uh, made it uh, that it's not going to be launched on a Falcon 9. Euclid is a visible and near infrared uh, optical instrument. Uh, it has it's going to have a 1.2 meter diameter uh, mirror, and the idea is that it uh, the idea of the mission is to better understand dark energy and dark matter by uh, measuring uh, with high precision uh, the how galaxies are accelerating and the distance between galaxies. It's it's basically um, you know the successor of of the Planck telescope in that respect. So um, this is going to be an, an amazing mission, and uh, and I just can't wait for it to be launched. Uh, we just need to have the, the clarification on the launch uh, window for this mission. Fantastic. Look forward to that. And, of course, Einstein. 
Yes, and Einstein. That's really interesting. I didn't have managed to get much information on this mission. It's a science. It's the the Chinese uh, Academy of Science mission, and it's supposed to be launched in Q four. And this, I just wanted to, to to put this mission in because it really highlights, you know, that China is really moving in strongly into uh, into into space research, uh, and and space science. And and this mission is is designed to. Uh, Study um, high energy events within uh, within the, the, the within the, the far distance universe. Um, it's supposed to launch in Q four, and its name Einstein, which I find quite interesting because they chose a, a Western name instead of a usual, you know, uh, a Chinese yeah. flavored name. Um, but I haven't been able to get very much information on on this on this mission as such. But uh, it's supposed to be. I wanted to put it this in because you know it's just you know it's just a um, shape of things to come yes indeed and and the chinese also um launching a, a space telescope of course to be attached to the um to the uh, tiangong uh, space station uh so that's that's interesting as well there's 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 so much going on in the chinese space program um absolutely um, yeah 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 JWST, I just wanted to put it in there because you know it's this year. <laughs> Ongoing. This year is just going to be. We're just going to be an avalanche of data and all the rest. So it's just like, how can I not put this in? Absolutely. Um, perseverance, ingenuity. I just wanted to put it there because ingenuity is like the little <laughs> copter that just goes and goes and goes. And you know how far will it go? We don't know, but uh, it's just it's just fascinating. And of course, perseverance is still caching its samples at the moment and carrying on uh, further up the delta at Jezero Crater. So uh, that's definitely a mission I, I want to follow closely. Definitely. And um, we, we should also mention, of course, that initially they thought they might get, uh, they hoped to get three flights out of Ingenuity. And, you know, the most they could possibly hope for was 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 five. Uh, and now how many flights has it done now? 26, 27, something like that? I'm not even counting anymore. No, no, it's 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 yeah. an amazing piece of engineering. I mean, you know, what can one say? Let's hope for more. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. And next mission, uh, one of my uh, favorite missions is the New Horizons, and it's it's going to come out of hibernation in March 2023. Uh, it's currently in hibernation, and it's on its uh, second um, uh, extended mission. Uh, the KM2, which I think stands for Kuiper uh, Extended Mission, basically, and uh, and basically it's going to come out of its uh, of hibernation. It's going to start observing for a few months uh, some of the objects within the Kuiper Belt and 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 beyond. Uh, going also looking back at uh, at the planets. So um, you know it's just great that this mission is just carrying on. It wakes up, it does science, and then it switches back itself off and carries on being you know hibernating in its way throughout the Kuiper Belt and beyond. And uh, who knows? I'm, I'm, you know, maybe we'll be lucky and it will be able to to find a, a close enough uh, Kuiper Belt object to to go and and whiz by like it did with Arakov. So that's definitely a mission um, that I think we should uh, we should definitely keep an eye on. Definitely. And it's been uh, and it's been four years since New Horizon um, uh, visited Ultima Thule since 2019. Yes, but we've we've we call it Arakov now, Michael. Ah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and, I, I must. I must agree with Michael. It, it took me a long time to get out of the habit of calling it Ultima Thule and calling it yeah. Aragorn. Uh, I, look, I I actually prefer Ultima Thule. I think it's. I think it has quite a sort of science yeah, fiction <laughs> flavor to it. Um, but 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 such it is. But it's an interesting point, Michael, because uh, and I think I mentioned it to Andy a few weeks ago. I didn't know this, but they haven't sent all the scientific data. Um, oh, right. When it was by uh, uh, Arakoth or Ultima Thule, it's still mm. sending this information when it wakes up of hibernation. It's fascinating. Right. Mm. Amazing. Let, let's uh, <laughs> let's see what else it has to show us then. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Bernard, uh, can I can yeah. I ask? Do you know once it wakes up? Do you know if uh, candidate uh, target objects have been selected yet, or is it still to be um, in, in terms of what? of other Kuiper Belt objects to observe. So, uh, yes, it will observe other Kuiper Belt objects, but from, from very far away. Um, so we're not talking about, you know, short flybys. Um, it has different targets that it's already been assigned to. 
Uh, but again, it's it's just I mean I mean the, the main the main beauty of this mission is that now because it's so deep into the Kuiper Belt, even if it looks from an object from far away, it's going to look at it from a different angle from a different angle from what we're looking at it from Earth. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be able to uh, get additional data on these different Kuiper Belt objects. So even if we just see a dot, that dot is going to provide a lot of information on this uh, for us. So. Yeah, so that's great that we have yet yet another spacecraft that is hugely outperforming its um, planned uh, mm. planned lifetime. Yeah, yeah, totally, totally. And uh, the, the, the latest estimates uh, is that it's going to last until the 2040s because it has you know, oh, yeah. plutonium um, uh, power. Uh, 238? On, yeah, mm -hmm. on, 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 booted on its, uh, on its bus. So, uh, yeah, no, it's... Another mission that's just carrying on and on and on, as you said. Yeah. I'm looking forward to this one. Um, interestingly, <laughs> I've just reminded me, um, they made a discovery recently of a Kuiper Belt object that appears to be rocky rather than icy, um, which has really sort of put the cat among the pigeons because I think they were um, they were assuming that a, a lot of the objects would be would be icy rather than, than rocky. But um, But anyway... We've got some amazing discoveries to make out there at the Kuiper Belt, yeah. And um, I, I think, you know, New Horizons for me is like Cassini and Galileo before it and, and things like this, um, mm. that, that um, you know, they, they are landmark missions in our, in our initial reconnaissance of the, of, the, of the solar system. So there Absolutely. we are. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, and that's why this mission is so important, because we're learning so much from, uh, from the Kuiper yeah. Belt itself. Yeah. Um, Andy, I had more to, to show. Uh, do you? Do oh, you sorry. To... Sorry. It's all right. Uh, maybe we're running out of time. I don't know. I, no, I don't no, mind no, doing no. this at this stage. You carry on. You carry on. Sorry. That's all right. That's all right. Um, another, uh, another mission, of course, is Juno, which will do a flyby of IO on the 30th at the end of the year. Uh, and it's really quite yeah. close flyby, 1,500K. So, um, yeah. Uh, watch the space. I think these images are going to be quite spectacular, even if we all know that Juno's camera is quite a, a basic camera uh, in relation to other cameras that are on board uh, space probes. Uh, it will pro most likely provide us with spectacular images from the surface of Io. I, another mission, by the way, Bar Barnard, as you were uh, discussing Pioneer, that was uh, intended mostly as a fields and particles mission. Mm. And I think the camera, if I'm not mistaken, I think the camera was uh either an afterthought or came uh, came along a bit uh later it was it was an afterthought and uh and it's a repurposed camera from uh from the uh, curiosity the the marty camera yep. Uh, yep. the mars descent imager camera uh when uh, curiosity rover uh, uh you know landed on mars and they they had a they had a, a, a spare so they repurposed that one and re-engineered it for for this mission so yeah totally Yes, absolutely. I, I'm, I'm just sighing because I'm like, oh, what, I'll, what, what's happening with all these field missions? I want imaging missions. <laughs> well, in fact, uh, there was a problem with Juno um, during the flyby of, I think it was December the 12th, was the latest flyby of Jupiter. And when um, astronomers came to download the images, um, they found that they weren't available on Juno. And um, they, they did what anybody with any computer does. They rebooted the computer and mm. they got the images back. And they think uh, the uh, problem occurred because uh, Juno had dipped fairly deeply into Jupiter's incredibly strong radiation belts, which had caused a glitch in the, in the computer. But they got it back and everything appears to be working now perfectly. Cool story. Thanks. Thanks for that, Andy. So yeah, Juno is still alive and live and kicking out there in Jupiter. So let's, let's keep on following it, following it throughout the year. And then I'm going through the launchers. Of course, uh, big events this year is uh, at some point Starship is going to launch, uh, and we'll just see what happens. <laughs> really, it's maybe January, February, we'll we'll see what happens. This this is going to be uh, quite spectacular and as revolutionary, I'd say, in terms of the launch industry as as the SLS and and, and SpaceX Falcon. And then we have uh, the Boeing Starliner, uh, which is supposed to launch its first crew mission to the ISS in April. Um, 
And I think, Andy, you had a nice comment on that last time we presented this. Yeah, the, the Starliner, of course, um, has had a, a, a very, very bad history of problems. And um, I think what I said last time was that you wouldn't get me going on that first mission. No, no amount of insurance in the world is going to uh, do that for you. Um, whoever goes, whoever are the astronauts to fly on this mission, I think they're very brave because, as we know, Boeing have had a total disaster with this spacecraft. It's probably going to fly a maximum of three or four times only uh, before it's uh, decommissioned. Uh, it's just been a disaster. And um, obviously, we wish the mission well. Uh, but, um, but, you know, you wouldn't get me flying up in that thing with its history. So that's all I wanted to say. Yeah, and, and the reason why I wanted to put it here is just to show again, you know, how much impetus there is in, in private, um, in the privatization of space, in new space. So, um, yeah. yeah, well, let's hope it goes well. Yes, uh, Ariane 6 uh, will expect to launch in Q4. That's the European Space Agency's workhorse uh, because Ariane 5 uh, has been faded out for this year. I think the last launch of Ariane 5 is going to be Juice. Uh, however, I'm not 100% sure. There might be another launch after that. So, yeah, that's, again, you know, a, a very big transition in the, in the, launch, uh, in the launch industry. Yeah, and then and then you know what, folks? There's just so much more going on. Uh, China's launching its new reusable launch vehicle, Darwin One, which is a private a Chinese uh, launch vehicle. Luxembourg's carrying on with microsatellites. Amazon's launching its first Kuiper satellites uh, with ULA's um, new uh, Vulcan Centaur launch vehicle. Actually, that's that's the upper stage, uh, but it's going to be the maiden flight of ULA's new upper stage. Uh, we have, of course, you know, this private mission um, to go around the moon. There's just so much going on. 2023 is going to be amazing, and we will hopefully be able to uh, go live on as many interesting launches as we can. But there we go, folks. Um, yeah, I'm just excited for 2023. And um, we have a question here from Stan. Is this the year of the sample return of Osiris? Yes, I believe it is. Absolutely. Yeah, September. Yes. September. That's right. So we I forgot that. about that. Totally, totally great, great catch. Uh, yes, yes, absolutely. We this is going to be uh, Osiris Rex. is a fantastic mission. It's packed so much more material it's in its sample back <laughs> yeah. than, than, than than it could. And uh, yeah, so we're definitely going to have lots of really cool science coming out of that. Good, good catch. I'll definitely put that. Up yeah, thanks first. for that, Stan. Uh, yes, uh, good catch. Uh, so there we are. Okay, then. Thank you so much for that, Bernard. Uh, as you said, a fantastic year to look forward to. Any major event uh, that we can cover live here on Space Oddities, we will do so. So stick with us and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll talk you through everything and uh, cover the launches live uh, if we can, uh, depending on what time they are, of course. Uh, so, so there we are. Okay, what I'd like to do now is to come uh, to Michael. Uh, Michael has got some uh, space news uh, for us, I believe, yeah, Michael. We have. Okay, just let me put that up for you then. You're okay. the slides, oh, yeah. There we oh, are. Yeah. Right, okay. Um, I'll set down the slide to the first one. Uh, okay, welcome everybody uh, to 2023. Uh, the first one I want to, to uh, talk about is the Soyuz um, uh, currently docked at the ISS that was there. You remember it was a hit by an object um, a couple of weeks ago and um, uh, fluid started uh, flowing out of the uh, uh, the uh, Soyuz itself, which is, uh, I believe, is some kind of coolant uh, for the uh, spacecraft. Um, there's been talk about um, what would happen if the Soyuz was uh, deemed unfit to uh, return to Earth with the uh, three astronauts, <coughs> one astronaut and two cosmonauts that, that would flow up on it in the first place, um, whether, whether it be suitable for them to come back. Uh, there's been talk about um, having another Soyuz, the, the one for the next crew uh, sent up early um, uh, to replace it. And, but also there's been talk about the um, possibility of a SpaceX Dragon, Crew Dragon, being sent up. Uh, the problem um, with the Crew Dragon, and um, I believe this is similar for the Soyuz, is the spacesuits that uh, the astronauts wear on the um, Crew Dragon are... Um, custom made to each astronaut basically um, so uh, if uh, a crew goes up on a 
for Soyuz, um, uh, they can't necessarily come back on a Crew Dragon. Um, I don't know if the uh, uh, panel wants to have a chat about that quickly. <laughs> Well, do you know what this reminds me of? I mean, I know it's stupid. Michael, you might remember this. There was a film in 1969 called Marooned. Do you remember it? Yes, I remember it well. (laughs) Uh, I think it was Gregory Peck, wasn't it, if I remember right? That's right, right. yes, it was, yes. It was Gregory Peck, where some astronauts on a... uh, It was basically an Apollo mission, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, Apollo hardware get trapped in orbit and they have to mount a rescue mission. Um, Yeah. Oh, no, this is quite reminiscent. Although we should say, of course, that nobody on the ISS is in any danger at all at the moment. Yeah. Uh, we must yeah. address that because some media reports I've seen are you know, making it look like a complete space disaster with people yeah. possibly dying. That's not going to happen. Not no, least. That's right. and, and also, I mean, um, you know, uh, they, 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 are, they are okay. Everybody on the space station is okay at the moment. And... Um, uh, NASA is expected to make an announcement uh, in the next couple of weeks, I believe. So uh, wait, wait to see what happens, and we'll bring it to you uh, when you find out. Absolutely, so, yeah. yeah. And just one final thing about the film Marooned. I went to the cinema to see it when it when it came out. All oh, right. And the sound in the cinema was so appalling, you couldn't understand a word yeah. of what was being said. So I had to go through the whole film trying to guess what was actually happening because uh, yeah. you just couldn't understand the dialogue. And it wasn't actually until quite a few years later that I managed to see it. And, oh, oh, that's what they were saying. <laughs> so so okay. there you are. The next yeah. thing I want to have a uh, talk about quickly is um, SpaceX has actually mm. launched 61 missions in 2022 almost double the, the number of missions it flew in 2021 uh which is you know amazing really for, for, for a private company let alone a government run company <laughs> uh to um, launch that many uh, missions uh, uh, virtually the same launcher yes it, uh, i think two of the missions but uh, falcon heavy is that right um, yeah yeah um but are they all reusable their uh, boosters um, some, some, I uh, at least one of them, um, uh, launched 14 times. Um, and, and I, I think it's, it's brilliant to think that, uh, SpaceX are operating, operating out of the two, um, space launch sites, one on the East coast and one on the West coast, mm. but on the East coast, of course, they've actually got, um, two launch sites, uh, uh launch com- com- complex 39A and of course launch com- complex 40. Yes. They, so they can have one getting ready whilst the other is uh, being found, which is brilliant. So, um, yeah, uh, but well done to SpaceX on that one. So Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, it's worth saying that 61 launches was um, just one short of double the number of launches yeah. from the year before, um, which was 32. This year already there are planned, I believe, 16 launches in January, January alone. Yes, that's right. That's yeah. right. And as I said earlier, 115 satellites being launched yeah. tomorrow in one mission. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and uh, yeah, and uh, Bernard's, Bernard's right. He's, he's just said we, we do live in a new golden age of space exploration. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Really yeah. After That's so right. many decades of, you know, compared to what we're seeing now, yeah. minimal activity in space. I know it's just like waiting for buses now, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All those um, missing, all those lost decades where we, yes, you know, not right. much was happening. <laughs> <laughs> and the last thing I wanted to talk about, a bit of astronomy, really. Um, China uh, has unveiled plans for a new ground-based telescope. Um, looks at the mirror looks a lot like James Webb with segmented uh, mirrors. Um, it's going to be the largest um, mirror when it's completed on a uh, ground-based telescope, actually, and it's going to. By 2024, there'll be um, it will be eight meters, uh, sorry, six meters. So it'll be similar to the James Webb, but by next year, and then it will be expanded to eight meters by 2030, by, just by adding extra segments um, around the around the outside. So that should be interesting to, uh, to follow when that uh, happens. So uh, looking forward to that one. Uh, when they say largest optical telescope, largest compared to what? Um, good point. I, I, I need to... Uh... <laughs> because don't forget that in, in about 2025, 2026, if all goes well, the Europeans uh, will open the biggest, uh, largest optical telescope ever built with a 39-metre mirror 
in uh, in Chile, the yeah. uh, extremely large telescope or ELT. Yes, that's true. Uh, so it'd be interesting to see why yeah. they think it's the largest. Anyway, just just a yeah, okay. Um, that's the thing. A small thing doesn't matter that much, but you know the Chinese are, are, are still very secretive about everything that they're they're doing. Mm. So details about all of these projects, as, as Bernard was mentioning earlier, they're very hard to come by. Yeah. Uh, so it, it's a bit of a shame that they're not more open about what they're doing, both on the ground and in space. But yeah. I guess that's the way they are. Yeah. So anyway, looking forward to that one. Uh, and that's all I have for tonight, I'm afraid. So. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Okay. Uh, right. So moving, moving away from that, um, we now come to the, the man with the mostest. He is, of course, your guide to the night sky. And uh, he's going to tell us all about what's up at the moment and in the future. So, Roger, what's going on? Well, here we go then. Okay, so we've got uh, some, uh, some news this week. I will show you in a moment. So here we are for this week. And uh, we've got, got the moon coming up and it's first... Oh dear, I've got the wrong slide up there. Right, we'll move on. <laughs> uh, that's the wrong slide for last week, but uh, there we go. Never mind. That's, uh, I've got some images I take between uh, Christmas and la uh, between Christmas and the New Year, and this is my uh, M80, M78 in Orion, which. Uh, is the first time I've managed to get something half decent from, and uh, <clears throat> not too bad. It's very atmospheric. I yeah, and like uh, here's my little quick rosette nebula that uh, I've done. I haven't quite got all the, I haven't got the Hubble palette on this one, but uh, it's managed to pick up some interesting colours in the background there of uh, of, of, of of around the uh, rosette nebula as well. So. I'll get back to that again at some other point. You've got some very yellow stars there. I've got some very yellow stars there. Yeah. Mm. Gosh. I don't know whether it's a characteristic of the camera, but uh, there we go. Uh, <clears throat> here is the uh, moon from today rising up in the through the daylight sky. Just stop um, it, will you, Roger? That's just disgraceful. <laughs> I know. I'm terrible like that. <laughs> That's probably why Lee was out, out uh, and not watching the program because he's trying to catch up with me with my star. Yeah. <laughs> the skies of uh, Spartford. And yeah. uh, we have still got some activity on the uh, solar surface at the moment. And this is what I managed to get uh, also today. So uh, working quite well there. Um, Ian, Ian McIntyre asks if it's a full moon this week. Yes, it is on Thursday. Right, there you go, in Thursday. Thursday. So uh, that should be of interest. But um, we've, as uh, <clears throat> may have been already mentioned, we've got the quadranted meteor shower, which <clears throat> will probably be best uh, in the wee hours of the 4th of January around about 3 o'clock in the morning. And they're sort of emanating from the um, booties area. That's correct. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, a bit further down in Corona Borealis, as at the moment, we've got a comet, um, the Comet C2 2023EZTF. <clears throat> and that <clears throat> is uh, under, uh, <clears throat> translated from the Zwicky Transient Facility, which uh, discovered it on March the 2nd, 2022, so almost a year ago. Yes, indeed. But now it's starting to come on, come into its own, and is becoming more visible. Uh, if you do want to see it, it is visible uh, during the early hours of uh, of the morning. But as later in the month, we can see it transiting up towards uh, Polaris uh, near the end of the month. So uh, it's working its way through uh, Corona Borealis, Bootes. Draco, and then further up to uh, Polaris at the end of the month. So that's uh, of interest to uh, people. And I will try and get hold of an image. Uh, it will be at its closest approach on the 1st of February when it will be about 42 million kilometres away. 
and it may may it's <laughs> be visible to the naked eye but comets are very finicky things it might might be brighter it might break up who knows indeed, so indeed. watch this space but uh, if there's images to be get, got i will have a go okay so obviously with uh, the night sky being clear if you're lucky you've still got jupiter visible and the moon is currently going through taurus and will be rapidly approaching uh mars in the night sky in taurus and uh this is what it would be like on the third so tomorrow night they will be uh, about a degree apart roughly in the night sky so that's one to watch although obviously we uh, appreciated the uh, occultation of mars uh, back last year uh, <clears throat> and obviously everyone's favorite constellation i'm guessing is orion which is becoming a very much favorable during the uh, early early months of 2023 okay and um uh, that's what I've got for you this evening. Well, thank you so much for that, uh, Roger. Some okay. uh, things to look forward to then, especially the comet. So, mm -hmm. so, so there we are. Okay, right. And uh, I just have to share um, a comment with you guys um, from Gerard, who says the item that hit the ISS wouldn't have been Harry Kane's penalty by by any chance. <laughs> um, Happy New Year to everyone. Love Rachel's Observatory. I want so great show. Thank you very much for that, Joel. Very, you're very I, kind. I have no idea who Harry Keynes is, but uh, no, I no, must not no, delve no, into no, this. No, no, mm. Don't, don't go there. Don't just, just don't. So uh, <laughs> you're, you're going to stir up a bit of a hornet's nest there, I fancy, if you if you persevere, sir. So, uh, so there we are. All right then. Well, uh, viewers, that brings us to the end of another show. Thank you so much for being here. We do appreciate you being here with us to share to share these things, and uh, and sharing our excitement about uh, about the universe. Um, I just want to say it's great to have Lou back and and well again. And also, we'd like to uh, shout out to Kareem. Uh, Kareem and his family have not been well at all recently. So Kareem, if you're watching, get well soon, mate, and come back soon. Because already in the comments tonight, Kareem, we've had somebody asking for another constellation story. So uh, you've got to get back here and give us some more constellation stories. That's an order. So get well soon. We're thinking of you. All right, then. So uh, keep the photos coming in to uh, as, uh, Space Oddities Live at gmail.com, as I said earlier. We will be back, of course, same time next week with, uh, with another show. And until then, have a fantastic week. And um, if you want to uh, make any comments, you can do so after the show's ended, of course, in the, in the comments on YouTube. And we'd also like to say thank you to those of you who's, who've joined us from Facebook, both from our own Facebook page and from the Astronomy Island Facebook page. So from all of us here on the panel, have a fantastic week, and uh, we will see you again soon. Say goodbye, guys. <laughs>